Good morning and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, I'm going to be taking a, a deeper look into Advanced Dungeons and Dragons First Edition Unearthed Arcana, and then answering the question, why is it still so playable? So um, just to give you a little uh, personal uh, connection uh, to this book. So my gaming group consisted of about four to five players, and we had on, on rotation, you know, rotated out being uh, DMs. Most of the time I was a player, but I, but I did start to uh, DM when this, uh, when this book came out. What this supplement did was it took a lot of what was in Dragon Magazine previously and made it official. All right. So, th so this is basically uh, AD&D 1.5, if you want to uh, consider it that way. And I loved this book when, when it first came out. And I started playing... Um, I was playing Barbarian class when it was first introduced in the Dragon magazine. So, you know, once it came here, I was like, all right, that's, you know, that's pretty cool that it, it was included here. And uh, Barbarians are a lot of fun to play uh, in first edition. But the real thing that was introduced, uh, you know, here and, and also in the, in the Dragon magazine was the, the Thief Acrobat. And the Thief Acrobat class was something that... Uh, you know, that I quickly moved my main character, who I played for roughly eight of the ten or so years that I was playing uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons with that group. And, uh, you know, so the Thief Acrobat became something that I was like, okay, I will become a Thief Acrobat now once I hit fifth level and, uh, and continued on all the way up to uh, being a Master Thief 18th level Thief Acrobat, he was a halfling, so I also uh, leveled up Fighter uh, along the way up to its maximum at the time, which I believe was a Fighter level 9. So, uh, and, and that's basically where his, uh, his career as an active player character uh, left off, because beyond, beyond that point uh, at, uh, you know, 18th and, and 9th level, he then went... Uh, and became a, uh, a quasi deity based on the uh, Dragon magazines once again. So, so that's my connection to this. I really liked this supplement. Um, you know, probably more so than than any of the others because uh, we we utilized it so much as far as uh, the character classes that were included and uh, some of the game mechanics and such that were also included as well. So. Without further ado, I'm going to switch over to the PDF and kind of walk you through it, and then I will come uh, back on to this uh, this screen here and you know move forward and wrap it up. Okay, wrong screen. Oh, here we go. And let me just make sure that it's here. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So here we have the here we have the PDF. It is a 132 page supplement, and you know by Gary Gygax, and he does a dedication here. I'm not going to spend too much time with uh, this particular dedication. The preface. Now that you have this tome in your hand. You are about to discover a new and exciting dimension in the advanced Dungeons and Dragons game world. You have unearthed the hidden mysteries of the work. So, so although they are no longer arcana, the contents are treasure. The AD&D game system is dynamic. It grows and changes as and expands. Our universe does all this and so too the multiverse of the game system. The description and definition of an intimate, infinite multiverse must necessarily be done piecemeal, adding new discoveries as they come to light, expanding horizons as the sum total of our past knowledge allows. 
The original volumes of the game system, the Monster Manual, the Player's Handbook, and the Dungeon Master's Guide, have altered from their first editions. So the game has changed in, the form, in form and substance. The new material grew from our own campaign, articles published in Dragon Magazine, and input from the many Dungeon Masters and players also. The book has a single purpose, Unearthed Arcana, brings new dimension to a d and game system. The compiled material, I just lost my space, sorry. The compiled material, which lies herein, offers fresh new approaches to play without materially affecting an ongoing campaign adversely. The work does not alter former laws of the multiverse, but it does open insights and vistas beyond those previously understood and seen. So it's basically a a branch off from the uh, from the original rule sets and such. So your your character can easily transition, um, you know, into like like I mentioned, uh, a thief acrobat. That that path opens up at fifth level. Now barbarians obviously and uh, and cavaliers are going to start off at. Uh, you know, first level as brand new characters, but uh, but this allows you to go in uh, in different directions or start new character classes. All the participants of the campaign will find that the material of the greatest interest and benefit to them. Dungeon Masters will discover new sub races and their interrelationships, new deity models for non humans, and much in the way of magic. And there's tons of new magic in here. And uh, I know uh, a previous uh, commenter on my channel had asked me to specifically look at uh, some certain spells. I'm not sure I'll actually get around to doing that, but that person is welcome to come in and uh, and comment about that, uh, you know, that particular spell that uh, he or she would like to discuss. Uh, they can always cut it and paste it right into the comment section and I'll deal with it in that way. Um, Going on, the effort was by no means mine alone. All right, so uh, Len Lakafka, as usual, contributed part. Roger Moore is a name in which all devotees of the game know. And also added to this are Luke Gygax and Frank Mensler, um, and so on. So a whole bunch of, uh, you know, now I, I would call them luminaries of the Dungeons & Dragons legacy. So you have Jeff Grubb, you have... Uh, Kim Mohan, you have, um, and others. I mean, there's tons of people mentioned in here. Introductions, warning, this book is loaded. As are all first edition. Uh, let, let's, not, let's not be, uh, you know, disconnected from the reality. Almost everything in first edition is, uh, is loaded. There's tons and tons of information, charts and graphs and, and all kinds of, uh, stuff that are in these but the major thing is is that they're you know almost everything is not part of the essential core core rules of the game and so almost everything is optional and they go on so once again following through with the uh with the trend that really started with uh, oriental adventures of having several different introductions and and comments by the people that really participated in it and so now we're going to get to the actual contents character abilities so comeliness comes in here like i like i said last time with the uh, oriental adventures oriental adventures introduced comeliness uh a tribute and so now what unearth arcana is doing is it's taking that comeliness a tribute and putting it as part of the overall uh, official rule set so that you can use this for any of your characters whether they're in the Oriel oriental adventures or in uh you know in other parts of greyhawk or whatever if you should you know choose to do Comeliness has, uh, you know, obviously different levels like any other attribute does, and then various things affect those, um, 
that, that attribute score as far as modifiers are concerned, including racial bonuses or modifiers uh, and such. So half orcs get a minus three comeliness, dwarves and gnomes get a minus one, halflings and humans get a zero, half elves and sylvan elves get a plus one, gray elves and uh, high elves get a plus two. Treat these pairs as being of the same race for the purposes of effective comeliness. Halflings are just as attractive or repulsive to humans as humans are to each other and vice versa. So everything is in a, in a human perspective. Um, so it is, it is from that view that these things are being attributed and, um, and so you have that. I know that's going to be a contentious thing of, you know, um, the more modern day, you know, players and, and people that kind of discuss where the game, uh, where the Dungeons and Dragons game should move into the future. And um, the whole idea of having racial traits has become something of, uh, you know, a bit of a, uh, a, a controversy and they're trying to move away from it. But uh, there's purpose and value uh, to having those differences. And, you know, we certainly were, were not aware, you know, at the time that uh, any of these things were really an issue. Uh, and, and they weren't for the most part, because I, I think back then the game was just played differently, uh, perhaps, than it is now. Um, and I, I think that with first edition, and, and this is my own editorializing, uh, I believe that first edition was more of a, an immersive gameplay uh, experience where you weren't looking to see real world aspects in the fantasy setting. You were looking to you know purely escape from anything um, of, of societal norms and, and, and such. So, it's, uh, you know, in, in my opinion, it's just a, an unnecessary uh, endeavor to, you know, become upset about these kinds of things. <coughs> so the character races and class, uh, class limitations. So now you have the Cavalier, which is new, and a Paladin, so they're kind of lumped together. Um... A cavalier is a is a subclass of of paladin. Uh, although you don't go from one to the other, uh, they're two separate lines. Um, you have clerics and druids. You have the fighter, and then the barbarian and ranger fall under the fighter uh, umbrella. Uh, once again, you don't shift from you know at level five fighter, you could become a barbarian or ranger. No, it's still you know separated in in that sense. Magic users are an illusionist. We're always there. The thief, and then you have the acrobat and the assassin. The acrobat is a, uh, a a different path for a thief. So, and I'll go into a little bit more detail because that was my character class of choice uh, when we get to that point. And they have the various uh, racial racial stock of of the character. So, who could become each of those character classes, and so on. Um, So here we have uh, ability scores and, you know, the differences because they have added new races. So dwarves are not just dwarves, but you have hill dwarves, mountain and gray dwarves. Um, for gnomes, you have uh, gnomes are introduced and they have, uh, let's see. Well, we didn't get to the, all of the racial breakdowns, but... You have gnomes and their differences uh, for their character um, attribute scores and how they're affected uh, and their requirements for the various classes. Elves, so you have broken down amongst clerics. You have uh, dark males, dark females, all others. For druid, you have wild elves and all others. For fighters, you have dark male dark female 
gray high valley valley wild and wood elves continuing for magic users and you have the various ability score um, minimums and maximums dark males dark females gray high valley wood for thieves they're all you know all uh, you so all uh, un unlimited or oh you the designation denotes unlimited level advancement so you have their level advancement uh, based on a tr you know ability scores and going all the way through and so on so tons and tons of tables now um, you have uh, subdivisions of halflings so you have harfoot you have stout you have tall fellow and then their their effects here so my my character, my elf character, uh, elf, I'm sorry, halfling character was a stout, and that's why he was able to attain um, a higher level of uh, of fighter uh, because of his uh, his strength at the time. And his strength over time was magically enhanced. That's how he ended up with the uh, with the eighteen. Uh, the 18100, or actually, I think it was 19 when he finished off. Half orcs and such. We have dwarves. And so now you have the various uh, sub races of dwarves explained. You have gray dwarves, and let's see, we go on the whole difference on gray dwarves. I guess that's the only uh, difference. Uh, add your various elves. Let's get to uh, <coughs> racial preference table. Again, something that would probably be considered to be somewhat controversial, but these are the basic acceptability of racial type. It doesn't mean that they're the absolute acceptability. It doesn't mean that all must conform to this. It just means that they, uh, you know, this is the average. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is, uh, so here we have the Cavalier. I actually played a Cavalier uh, briefly uh, back then. Uh, I'm fairly certain my, my Cavalier um, had died only after a few sessions. The Cavalier is often looked at uh, nowadays as being kind of an overpowered class. Um, and I, I don't necessarily understand why, uh, because they've never gone into that detail. They've just said, you know, oh, a Cavalier is, is, is way overpowered without very much explanation. Um, looking at some of their abilities, so at first level, they have a plus one to hit with a lance. I, I, well, if used while mounted, at plus three, uh, Cavalier is plus one to hit. With either a broadsword, longsword, or a scimitar, player's choice. At level five, they are plus one to hit either the horseman's mace or horseman's flail. At seven, they're plus two to hit with the lance if used while mounted. At plus uh, at ninth level, they're a plus two to hit with either, you know. So at the most, at thirteenth level, a cavalier is plus three to hit with a lance if used while mounted. So. Essentially, their most of their abilities are are really enhanced when they're mounted, and when they're dismounted, I don't see that they're getting any major bonus. Uh, at eleventh level, they're getting plus two to hit, uh, you know, or even at ninth level, they're getting plus two to hit with their more common weapon uh, to be carried, whether it's broadsword, longsword, uh, or scimitar. As far as uh, experience point uh, cap, it's um, or leveling up uh, to go from first to, to second level, you need 2,501 experience points, which is which is not the highest around. Uh, it, it's somewhere in the in the upper 
higher levels, so it does take a little while to, um, to become a Cavalier, but not tremendously long. Let me talk about Druids. And just the higher, the higher level experience points for Druids. Fighter weapons, uh, special weapon, uh, weapon specialization is introduced in here. And so that, that starts to increase the number of attacks per round that you get, um, and, and so on. So weapon specialization added a, a, a major power boost, uh, to fighter classes. Uh, and particularly to fighters, uh, pure fighters. So they they started to really dish out some additional damage and and have abilities to hit and such. Uh, you know, so weapon specialization is a is a major component uh, introduced in this, and uh, and I think it was an important component as well. So only members of the fighter class and the ranger class can make the use of a weapon specialization. So it's not going to apply to barbarians or uh, cavaliers or uh, paladins. And the number of attacks per round, and, and this is the, the real big bonus, is that they'll get three attacks every two rounds uh, for first to sixth level. Um, so, you know, one attack the first round, two attacks the second, and so on, back and forth, back and forth. The Barbarian class, now, this is a powerful class at first level, all right? They're getting, you know, max double hit, uh, max double uh, die for, uh, you know, for first level. And uh, they get plus two hit points per point of constitution over 14, as opposed to the normal constitution bonuses. So they tended to have a lot of hit points even at first level. And when you take a look at their experience points, they need 6,001 experience points to get to second level. That is, uh, without looking at the overall charts, that I guarantee you is the highest of any class. Uh, and that harkens back to OD and D and, and the leveling up a, uh, leveling up an elf i mean uh and even they weren't in the six thousand range uh you know of that so to get to second level uh, takes a long time for a barbarian character but once they do i mean they do become a very powerful character class but mostly at first level um which is an interesting thing uh to deal with there I said I played uh, I played a barbarian uh, back when it was first introduced. Although I think I played it when it was introduced in the Dragon magazine. Uh, I, I could be a little bit off. Um, that character that character died uh, fairly early on in his career as well. <coughs> Most likely one of the characters that I lost in uh, Tomb of Horrors. But let's get you to the Thief Acrobat. Any Thief character with a minimum strength of 15 and a minimum dexterity of 16 may decide to forego normal thievery after rising through the fifth level of experience and become a split class specialist, a Thief Acrobat. The Thief then leaves off all practices which increase his or her manual dexterity and begin a regimen of physical exercise in order to build coordination, muscle tone, and balance. Their program of gymnastics precludes any further progress in the following skills. Pickpocket, open locks, they never gain read magic, finding traps and removing traps. <coughs> so, that doesn't mean they lose these skills. They still keep these skills at the fifth level. It's just that they're going to 
now take a different path and they're going to start picking up the, you know, uh, the primary functions and skills of basically like a cat burglar. Tightrope walking, pole vaulting, uh, anything that is more to do with strength and coordination. So jumping distances, high jumping and such. So they go here to the, um, the thief acrobat table for experience points. So at 20,001 experience points, they are sixth level and they're a burglar acrobat. And then they move all the way up to, uh, level 12, which is a, uh, a master thief acrobat. And then they can continue, uh, going beyond that. Uh, so 250,000 experience points per level for each additional level beyond 12. And as I said, my, my character finished up at uh, 18 uh, in that class. So their functions uh, plus their racial adjustments. So tight walking, uh, tight rope walking, pole vaulting, high jumping, the standing broad jump, the running broad jump. They gained tumbling maneuvers of an attack percentage and evasion percentage and a falling. Uh, so you could fall up to 10 feet, 25% chance of not taking any damage and so on as it goes up in level. And then there were racial adjustments for those various uh, skills as well. So looking back at my character, if I was 18th level, I could tightrope walk at 100%. I could pole vault 15 feet. Now I'm going to have the halfling minus, so 13 feet. High jump at 8 feet. I'm going to minus 1, so 7 feet high jump standing. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, high jump standing. Uh, standing broad jump, 11 feet, so most likely 9.5. Uh, looking at that. And so on. Falling... I gained a 5% chance. So I had an 85% chance of taking no damage from a 40 foot or less fall. <coughs> Their adjustments for strength will then increase those things. Their adjustments for dexterity would then increase, uh, increase these as well. They had an encumbrance uh, bonus for being uh, because they they would be able to balance out their the weight of what they were carrying a little bit better, more knowledge of doing so. So now we go into you know various weapons, and some of these weapons are are going to be new and introduced. We have new spells. <clears throat> Plus, you know, obviously the older spells as well, but they are going to introduce some new spells uh, in here. It would have been nice for them to, you know, mark off which ones were newly introduced. Uh, ita uh, spells in italic type are described in this volume. Oh, I see. So they, they actually do that. They should have done a better than just uh, italic because it's hard to see. It looks like invisibility to undead is an italic and so it'll probably be described here. And we'll see, we'll see which ones are newly introduced. Cantrips, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that cantrips were, um, were introduced with this as well. They probably came out of the Dragon Magazine and uh, and we utilize cantrips quite a bit. Um, they're, they just have certain um, like flavor kind of adding to it. So um, yeah, we, we liked cantrips. We liked using them uh, with our magic using player characters. And uh, you know, it just, it was usually just to do those kind of little tricks. So kind of like the, the, the Gandalf fireworks kind of displays that um, that there were. So let's see.
All right, so ceremonious and introduction for clerics. Penetrate disguise, enduring cold, enduring heat, invisibility to undead. This spell is quite similar to sanctuary, but only affects undead of four or fewer hit dice. A saving throw versus spell is made for each type of undead within 30 feet of the caster. All right, uh, I'm going to try to remember what... Um, what that commenter was saying and which which spell to take a look at uh, but all of these are new spells introduced in this volume death store when a clerk employs this spell he or she touches a human or demi-human who is unconscious and at death's door the spell immediately brings the individual to zero hit points. Uh, that's a fairly useful, um, a fairly useful uh, spell. All right, let's uh, let's go on because I think it was a magic user spell that. Uh, the poster mentioned. Uh, these are cantrips. Still cantrips. So here we have some mention of Tasha, which is in the is the new uh, the new supplement book from Wizards of the Coast. Mel's minute meteors was a fairly common spell to take uh, in our group. Black Tentacle, Everett's Black Tentacles was another one. A lot of fun to play around with that as well. Lehman's, Lehman's Secure Shelter. Odaluke's Resilient Sphere. Mostly named spells. You know, uh, spells named after their... Uh, after the magic users that created them are fairly powerful and useful spells. It's not jumping out at me just yet. We're already up to level seven. Yeah, it's not jumping to me right now. I'm not seeing it. But anyway, um, let's see. We'll get past spells. It might have even been a magic item that he was suggesting I take a look at. So method five. The method can be used. So this is for ability score generation. This method can be used uh, can only be used to create human player characters. It gives a player an opportunity to generate a character of a desired class subject to the DM's approval and is assured that the ability scores for that character will meet the minimum requirements of the class in question. So the number of dice rolled. So for a cavalier, they would roll eight d6 
in order to get the desired uh, ability score that they were looking to uh, attain. So after player selections a cast approval, he or she rolls the certain number of dice uh, for each of the ability scores to generate, as indicated by the table below. The best three dice rolls are, um, are an ability are added together to produce the score. So you're going to roll, you know, 8d6 and take the three highest you know the the good chance of getting a uh, of getting at least two sixes uh, thrown in there. Um, you know, so there's a you know there's a uh, a variety of uh, actually I'm going to do it right now and uh, so they would get eight five four seven nine for Constitution. Let me switch views here. So here we'll we'll see how my uh, how my character would do. So the three highest is a six, a four, and a five. So a fifteen would would have been that uh, you know that potential roll. And uh, let's go back to. I doubt a 15 is even high enough for the minimum standard for a Cavalier. Starting hit points for characters. Uh, so once again, you're going to roll their, their D and then roll the number of times, you know, versus that. Um, we always did just a, a starting, starting roll of uh, you start at first level with maximum hit points. And that did not lead to any kind of a a real save because our our two DMs, uh, you know, were were pretty. Well, one was definitely brutal, you know, and then the the other was was still, you know, fairly uh, fairly straightforward with the rules and such. Uh, we had no problem with uh, losing characters. And the fact that we had characters that lasted as long as they they did uh, was because we became very cautious in the kind of chances that we took along the way. So the campaign, so an introduction of social classes. And once again, social classes is something that came out of... Uh, that came out of uh, Oriental Adventures as well. So now you have its introduction to, you know, ideas of, uh, you know, the rest of the game. Uh, so the settings of the rest of the game, you could include this as optional, optional background information for your characters. Circumstances of birth, marital status of your parents, Racial modifiers uh, based on those. We get to treasures. And like I said, I'm not going to go over any of these in particular. So if you see something or want to um, bring my attention to any of these, then just, uh, just cut and paste into the comments section and then we can discuss them uh, separately. I'm just looking for things that jump out. Robe of vermin. <laughs> so. I'm just reading. <coughs> I'm looking to see what it actually does. So this magical seeming seeming garment will radiate a dim aura 
of enchantment if magic is detected for. The wearer will notice nothing unusual when the robe is donned and will actually convey some magic power at the time. Protection plus one, for example. However, as soon as the wearer is in a situation which requires his or her concentration and action against hostile opponents, the true nature of the garment will be revealed. The wearer will immediately suffer a multitude of bites from the vermin which will magically infest the garment. He or she will have to cease all other activities. So it's a cursed item, right? Um, now that's a pretty unfortunate thing to have. Uh, I'm still just scrolling through and looking for things that jump out. Non-lethal combat, so subduel, vanquishing, disarming. Non-human deities, so they add they add to the previous list of non-human deities. And let's see what they finish off with. Now, here they described a uh, sphere of control. Um, just thinking on that, and, and the way that I deal with the uh, with uh, clerics as player characters in my group is that uh, let's say if you were um, you were a dwarf and you were following a dwarf deity, I would look at the sphere of control and those are the things that their clerics have to do on a fairly regular basis in order to uh, basically get their their favors, their spells uh, every you know on every day. All right, so uh, they they don't have to go to war and battle every day. Uh, if they're a first level character, they might have to participate in a war and a battle maybe once a month in order to have that full month. But as they get higher level, they have to engage in those spheres of control uh, more and more often. All right. So, um, so as you can see, it's, it's a little bit more flavored than just saying, oh, my character is the same alignment as my uh as my character's deity and so you have that as long as they're the same alignment or within the same alignment range they have that same um same access to those spells or favors i'd rather have them actually demonstrate it through uh activities with the sphere of control Um, so a section on weapons. Additions and corrections. And so on. So. So there you have Unearth Arcana. And when we take a look at this book and, and, and say, well, how does this still make the game so playable today is that um, it does add extra layers of, uh, you know, of comp complexity. It kind of balances out some of the character classes a little bit more, such as, you know, giving fighters and rangers uh, that additional weapon specialization skill. Um, it introduces barbarians, but with that high, very high threshold of going up from one level to the next, it gives the uh, it gives the thief class 
uh, a different route to go that might be a little bit more um, suitable for Dungeoneering, um, you know, as it is, but they still maintain their, their regular, uh, their regular Thieves abilities, but at a, you know, locked in at that level five level moving forward. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot here that will, will certainly, uh, advance, you know, the gameplay and, uh, and there's a lot here that you can, you know, also just say, well, I'm, I'm going to choose not to do that as well. So, um, you know, it is a, a true, you know, valuable, uh, addition to first edition and it's, uh, you know, and, and in my opinion, it does make the game uh, more playable for those, you know, for those players that want to utilize these these new and different options, new classes, new spells. The spells have and, and magic items, uh, you know, are just a, a different way uh, of, you know, giving the giving the players something a little different than what they've, you know, grown accustomed to because remember this is coming out in 1985 and so some people might have been playing first edition since 79 or so and so they're you know 79 80 so they've been playing the game for like five years and this is the first uh official addition to uh those rules that they had been playing at um unless they were like my group and we were pulling a lot of stuff out of dragon magazine ahead of time but having it all in one volume was certainly a, a benefit to us. So once again, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, remember to use that comment section. If there's any particular thing that you want me to focus on in the comments, uh, just cut and paste it right in there if you have the PDF, obviously, uh, or just mention it uh, and uh, you know with a page number, and then I will take a look at it, and we could have that discussion there as well. And uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. Uh, channel is doing really well. It's picking up, uh, you know, we're, we're above 900 now and looking to, you know, hit that 1,000. And uh, I'll see what I do at the, at the 1,000. I'll probably have another giveaway. I'm going to be giving away soft cover uh, voucher uh, for a, uh, for blah, <laughs> can't think right now. Uh, for survive this uh, survive this fantasy RPG, and um, and that that shouldn't be too far off uh, getting there about ninety three away from one thousand, and so I expect to be there within two months. I'm hoping. So <coughs> anyway, sorry about the cough. Uh, you know, it's that that time of the year. So once again, thanks for joining. I'll look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen sometime soon. You'll have a great afternoon. Take care.